But let's get into our first trade. So we've got this setup that occurs. So when we're looking at this price action, what do we see? We see a lot of indecision. We see an area where the sellers stepped in and an area where the buyers were stepping in. So we had a range developed. What we classify a range, it can go to the top of the range, it can come to the bottom of the range, but then we have a consolidation that occurs. And you can see the buyers tighten up and the sellers tighten up. We have a little bit of a what looks like a range uh, consolidation breakout that occurs up here, but it doesn't clear the range. So now all we're thinking of is if this comes down and gets below the low of this consolidation, we can look for a trade to the downside. We're observing the price action and we're putting together the pieces based on one candle at a time. And we've got this sped up like 10x. So in general, this is going to move pretty quick, but we're going to talk about the specifics of the trade. So our number one trade, the first consolidation break trade that we could look for would be a consolidation breakout either above the high of this level or below the low of this level, kind of outside of our blue lines. If we're taking a straightforward consolidation breakout trade, we're paying attention to the price action, we're seeing the selling pressure build up. We can enter if there is a full close below that range. If that occurs, then our stop based on the price action, based on the technical analysis would be up above the highs of the range. So we can get in right here on that candle and our stop is above the highs of the range. We would risk accordingly. There's another option though. And that other option would be to trade a break and retest. We call it a second chance scalp. So that would be price action that breaks the range, but we notice how choppy that range is. When the range is that choppy, we oftentimes will get a retest of that range, of the backside of the range. And then we want to take the continuation trade. So what we're looking for specifically is the price action to test into that. We wanna see it put in a distinct high on the retest, right? And then we're looking for continuation to the downside. So let's watch the tape as we get in here and watch the price action unfold and see if we can see a distinct, clear failure on the test. Okay, we have that. So now our stop can go right above the highs of that candle. And we can look for the first close away, which we have right here. And we can take that trade to the downside. Now, the rules are that our initial exit would be right here at the low of the range. But the reality is, let's look at what happened. We had this entire range that set up. We can think of it as a range break trade or a consolidation breakout trade. And we can look for two times the height of that range as our exit. So we're getting like insane risk to reward if we're taking that second chance with our stop right here and our entry right here. We're still getting really good risk to reward if we enter the trade here with our stop up here because we're still looking for two to one. These are different trades, but they're both really valid trades. And it truly depends on how aggressive you want to be with your trading. We're seeing this continuation, and this is giving us a guide as far as where we should be taking our exits. Again, we're thinking about this range, right? Whoa, there we go. So that's where we'll take our exit. We had a really distinct move that went two times the height of the range that was there. That is a really good, straightforward, two-to-one range trade. When you get a break out of a range, the most simple way to do it is look for a two-to-one. Let's talk about the next trade because we're already setting up the next trade. The next technical analysis component that we're going to talk about is extension. So we just covered what ranges are. Now we're going to define extensions. Extensions and overextensions are just a measure of the distance traveled over the time. So this is a minute chart. So we're looking at how quickly did this distance travel in the time that it took. We were consolidating for a pretty significant period of time. And this entire distance, twice the distance of the height was traveled 20% of the entire time of that consolidation. That's a pretty fast sustained move. Because of that, we can look for maybe a failure and some sort of retracement. We actually get this as it's setting up right there. Did you notice how we tried to break down and we put in what's called a double bottom? That's actually a bottoming pattern. And when we have that extension combined with a pattern, we have a low put in, we have a, a move up, we have another low put in. And then when we break what's called the neckline right here, we can enter our trade long. Our stop would be below the, the entire low of the move, right there. And we're targeting at least a one-to-one. -one. This isn't a super high probability trade. This is a very straightforward fade trade though. So when we get our one-to-one -one target right up into here, which happens to be another thing where we're, we're running into, okay, we take our exit. That's it. That's the whole trade. We combine the extension component with a price action component. We wait for the neckline to get broken. We take our trade and we look for a one-to-one. -one. So we're skipping forward and we're looking at what's occurring again. And we've seen the same setup occur where it's this range that's forming. And we've got a range that's conformed by the horizontal trend line on the top and the horizontal trend line on the bottom. We're seeing buyers step in every time it comes down to the lows and sellers step in every time it tests the highs of the range. People will say, oh, look, there's a triangle. And I guess that is true. We could look for the break of that. And if you take that trade, you have a really nice, again, break and retest of that. And then we would look for a move up here. Your stop would go below the low of the triangle and you would be targeting price action coming right up here. The challenge with this trade is, and it is a tricky one, it's because it's in the middle of congestion. It's in the middle of all of this range. We call this stuck in range or midpoint. 
This is basically midpoint. So could it work? Yeah, but is it a high probability trade? No. If you took this exact same setup, this exact same price action right here, and you put this at the high of the day or the low of the day, it would be a much higher probability trade. But when it's stuck in all of this nonsense, all the up and down, it's stuck in the middle of this entire range, you have a super tricky trade. And think about it from the perspective of the participants involved. You have traders on both sides here who were in from the lows or in from the highs, and they're going to cause all this havoc in the price action. So it becomes really, really difficult to actually look for a clean move. This is one of the key principles of any technical analysis is you want to avoid mid-range trading. And the reason why you want to avoid mid-range trading is simply because mid-range patterns are more prone to failure. Patterns are, and technical analysis in general, is best used at the extremes. So it's used when there's been a very clear reset and a very clear extreme that's built up on, one, on, on either the highs or the lows, or a very clear overtime pattern. Those tend to be the best. When it's mid-range and it's choppy like this, it's really, really difficult to get an accurate read, and you can be fodder for, unfortunately, the market makers that are going to push it in both directions, stop people out of their position, and then rebid. There's the old expression, if it doesn't scare you out, it's going to wear you out. And a lot of times being mid-range is going to be a, is going to be a big problem in that. So you can look at the trade and you can say, oh, it stopped me out at the lows, and now it went to the highs. The reality is it's probably something to avoid entirely. But let's, let's see what happens when we come up into this resistance area, right? We have this clearly defined resistance area. And again, we have our clearly defined support area. We're talking about a range here. It looks like we're going to break out of that. Right? So are we going to take that range break trade? Well, let's look at the difference from this, the price action moving up in this side versus the way the price action moved on the other, on the prior range break. When we're looking at technical analysis, you could say, yes, these are both range break trades. But when we study the price action and the way the range broke, when we study the price action and we look at the strength that led into that, we recognize that this range, either it's going to work really well or it's going to fail. And the reality is this is more prone to fail when it's come a long way into it. Think about the energy that it's used to get to that point. From the low of the range to the high of the range very, very quickly. When we look at what happened previously, it was very methodical. It was like that momentum, that supply was, was kind of building and building and building. And then finally, when the range broke, it really broke. This was almost chasing. So it went right up to the highs of the range. So that's something that you always need to be aware of. It is more prone to failure when it goes a long distance fast. You actually want to see what's called a running break, which that running break is usually three or four candles that just kind of one, two, three, four, and then break. You don't want to see a sprinting break. Sprinting breaks are usually really, really tricky, and they're, they're prone to more failure. As the price action fails, you could actually take a failed breakout trade here. That's a part of the reason why you want to respect the price action as it's coming in. The failed breakout trade would be once you get a close below that range, you would be stop above the high of that range. Why? Because the stop would tell us it's placed based on where the sellers wouldn't let it get higher. Our entry would be as soon as the bar breaks the low of this little tiny range, right? This range is built out. We would be looking for it to fail and then go to the other side of the range at least. And we see how fast it went up and we see how fast it comes down. That's a failed breakout trade or a failed range break trade. You want to be as close on entry as you possibly can be. You want your stop to be just above the highs and you always want to target the other side of the range. All right, so we jumped ahead just a little tiny bit, but let's look at what the price action is telling us. Each individual bar is showing some indecision, right? We have a red bar and then a green bar and then a couple red bars and then a green bar and then a red bar and then a green bar. What is the price action telling us? It's telling us that sellers are pushing, right? Because we have a downtrend. We have clearly lower highs and lower lows made almost each bar. But we're also seeing that buyers are stepping in. This is something to take note of, especially when you're seeing something like this. I press down into the lows of the range because the question we're asking ourselves is how sustainable is this? And one of two things can happen. The sellers can take absolute control, which is a viable option. What would we look for? We'd probably look for like a second chance break, or we would look for maybe, a, you know, a little consolidation that goes sideways. So we'd see the pattern change, maybe a little pop and see, you know, before we break, see that buyers try and take control, something like this, and then look for it to actually roll over. We would use a stop above the high of, of wherever that pop comes from, but we don't want to get into the predictive nature. We want to get into a game where we're waiting to see what happens. We're thinking about what could happen. And then we're putting ourselves in a position to allow that to happen. That's one of the key things of technical analysis. It's listen to the price action in order to understand what is happening so you can adjust your trading to what you want to see happen, to basically what is going to happen for you. So right now we have something that we call chop or hot garbage, right? The price action is holding near the lows, but is it trading like sellers are in absolute control? No, not at all. It's just super choppy. We don't know which direction this is going to go. We don't need to predict what direction this is going to go. We don't need to pull out our, our, our book and say, what pattern is this? Because the action isn't showing that there's any real information to be had here. It's like when we went back to our mid-range trade previously. This is just chop. Wait for a change and look for something that's clear. All of our price action patterns, all of our technical analysis work better when there is clear participation. They tend to and are prone to failure for continuation when the price action is really choppy. And a very simple way to look at how choppy the price action is, 
is look at the size of the wicks relative to the size of the bodies of the bar. Because we had that forced breakdown that we just saw, we can now think to ourselves, if we get continuation lower, what would we look for? Well, we want the price action to be clean. If we get a move back higher, what would we look for? Well, we would want it to get above some sort of level, right? We want something like prior resistance. Like, so let's say this area right here where we saw the sellers not really give any room to the buyers, right? We saw the buyers try and step in. We'd want that area to act as support. So a key tenant could be prior resistance becomes support. The reality is, could you have taken this trade and made money? Absolutely. Would it have been difficult? 100%. There are traders who will take this trade and they will do very well with it. They'll say, oh, I shorted that and look, I, I, I was rewarded. But based on the price action, it's telling us that this pattern is somewhat prone to failure. This pattern isn't really supported by the real participants that we like to see. When we look at each individual bar, we put those together to get the price action. We can think to ourselves, well, what's really happening? This feels forced. This doesn't feel right. Are we really sure that we're gonna get the continuation we want to see? And then we monitor to see if there's something distinctly different. And what we're seeing right now seems to be a little different. Do we notice how quickly, how quickly that changed off the lows? Now we can use this little area right here to monitor for the potential of something that's different. We see it holds. Okay, it's trying to go higher. That's very, very interesting. Okay, now we can think about, do we have a failed breakdown? We talked about the failed breakout on the other side, but do we have a failed breakdown? We need to combine it with a price action pattern. So we still don't have a price action pattern, but we're gonna get into one right here. So we moved right up into that area, that area of prior support. The way that it traded lower and then came in here makes us think, look at the distinctness of this selling. Well, if we break this to the upside, we have something that's called an ABC scalp. A on that first leg, B on that very clear distinct selling pressure right at that key level. And then if we break this to the upside, now we can look for a C leg. That is a trade that we can make. Our stop goes simply right below here and instinctually, we're thinking that this can grind higher. We're going to use the 9 EMA as our trailing stop. That's this blue, light blue line that we have right there. And you'll notice it's been on our chart the entire time. The 9 EMA is just a moving average, an exponential moving average. That exponential moving average gives us a lot of information about which direction, who's really in control. In momentum type trades, price will hold that 9 EMA. In extreme momentum, price will pull away from that 9 EMA. All we're doing in this little ABC scalp we took right here, stop right there, is we're looking to see, does the price action start to continue to show momentum to the upside? Why are we doing that? Because we observed the type of selling that was occurring as the price action was coming lower. It's a little tiny thing, but these little things become so, so, so important. Now we're back up above this entire area and we have that really strong extension. We're still trailing with that nine EMA. We can trail our stop, trail our stop, trail our stop with that nine EMA. We allow the price action to do what it's going to do. Now, the reason why this trade would work so well is because of the weakness of this breakdown. We talked about it the entire time. This doesn't seem right. This doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. This is the response from that. We had this really distinct price action pattern that we could trade when we, we didn't need to trade off the lows. We could wait for that to come in. And now we can trail our stop all the way up, still using that nine EMA. At this point, we're almost to VWAP, the purple line, which tells us that that's a balance point on the day. VWAP, the volume weighted average price, is always typically a balance point. That's why a lot of traders will have VWAP and the nine EMA on the chart because they're seeing what side of the momentum we're trading on, but then also we're looking at what side of balance are we on? Are the sellers generally on the day in more control than the buyers? When you get that hard move up to VWAP, well, that's a really, really good, very clear, distinct move. We still haven't had to exit our position because we haven't had a close below the nine EMA. When we have all of this occurring right at this area that was prior resistance, we're likely going to get stopped out here. And that's perfectly fine. That convergence concept that becomes so important where you have, you know, a 9 EMA going up into that level and, and VWAP right there, that becomes so, so, so important. But let's look at where the price action is pulling back to. So we took our stop and it pulled right back into this level of prior resistance. Does this become support? Once we get a close back up, we could take a long trade with our stop below the low of the wick. Right there, we could take a long trade with our stop below the low of the wick. Again, going back to our second chance scalp, and we're targeting, in this case, the natural target, which is the high of that range. We sit in the price action, and then we exit the trade just like that. So what have we really covered here? I understand this isn't a normal technical analysis video. You're not looking here and, and saying, oh, Jeff, you didn't teach us about patterns. You didn't teach us about, about this and that. What we talked about was the absolute psychology involved in the price action as it evolves. If you want to know patterns, we talked about a cheat sheet, technical analysis patterns that traders will use on the desk. Uh, they have rules around them. We didn't include the trades because the reality is you need to, to have a trade, even when you have a pattern. A pattern in itself on our desk is not a trade, it's just a pattern. You still need a defined stop and you need a defined entry criteria and you need a defined target. And I understand that a lot of technical analysis does include those elements, but as we saw in this video, when you look at the actual price action, that's telling a story that the technical analysis 
sort of tends to skip over. And so you want to be thinking about not just what is the pattern that is unfolding, but how is that pattern unfolding? What are those individual pieces of information telling us? And how do we put those together in order to identify appropriate price action for us? When we can put those together, we're identifying what is happening, but then also what's potentially likely to happen next. And that can just put different trades on our radar. And once we have different trades on our radar based on our listening and our understanding of what is happening, we can put ourselves in those really high probability moments over and over and over again as traders. This is Actually, I really distinctly remember one of my worst uh, like rips ish initially after joining the firm. And I was in this trade and it was a breakout trade and I waited for the setup to occur. And I was really excited about it because all the variables seemed there, right? It was nice consolidation. The, the, the time of the consolidation was appropriate. The volume seemed okay, but not great. You know, like the, the width of the consolidation the, the, or the height of the consolidation, the range was kind of what I was looking for. It started to do exactly what I thought was perfect. Couldn't have asked for a better setup. And I was really excited because, you know, I was here at the firm. I'm, I'm ready to put my risk on, ready to show everybody what I've got. Imagining myself, like thinking about how well this is going to trend into the close. And I, I'm going to be the trader that everybody's talking about after hours. Like, man, that guy crushed it. As soon as I put the trade on, as soon as it broke out, it tricked me. It started to kind of work. And, and that led to this overconfidence in the trade. It started to go up and it went up quickly. And I was like, oh, this is great. Maybe it's even gonna work better than I think. Maybe I won't have to wait till the end of the day. Maybe it's just gonna go and go and I'll take my profits. And maybe by like two o'clock in the afternoon, I'll be getting those high fives from everybody on the desk. All of those things started happening in my mind very quickly. It seems like almost instantly the trade started going against me. It had gone up, it stalled, and then started to come back against me. And I froze. Legitimately, I think the combination of my expectations for what was possible, being up in the trade, the p &L, and then how quickly everything went against me, that led to that freeze just an absolute freeze. I mean, thankfully I had a stop in place and, and I was able to get myself out because of that, but I made a commitment to myself that I was not gonna let it myself experience that freeze again. I was just gonna find a way to take that off the table. I'd identified that, that trade working for me, having those high expectations for the opportunity and then having something change and quickly have it come against me. Exactly what happens at a failed breakout, I identified that was a big trigger for me, for my trading. That was something that caused me to make a big mistake, one of the worst mistakes you can make in trading and just freeze. So I became obsessed with identifying good breakouts and then more importantly, how to sidestep the failed breakouts. Breakouts are just captivating. So we're going to define breakouts. And we're going to talk about like this common misconception that, that we'll clarify in a little bit. But defining the breakout, essentially, we're talking about a range that's built with multiple touches on each side. We define it typically as two touches on either side of a distinct range. That creates that range with a clear visual pattern. What's happening during the breakout is this energy is building up. The momentum for the stock is building and we're expecting this powerful resolution. Most of the best breakouts evolve from trading in that range, that distinct price action into a consolidation prior to that breakout. Consolidation and ranges are very similar definitions. The distinction exists in that a range can last infinitely. A consolidation almost always, and, and a part of the consolidation is it has a pending resolution to it. So when we're talking about ranges, we're expecting it to just continue because there's no expected resolution to that. A new catalyst has to come in, new change has to occur in the price action to lead to a break of that range. When a consolidation is occurring, we are planning for and expecting a pending resolution. So that distinct change can be really, really important, but not all breakouts are what they seem. I'm sure everyone here has been in a trade, seen a really good breakout, taken the really good breakout, have it look like it might work, and then it just go against you into a false breakout. A rough estimate is that 60% of all breakouts uh, retest and that 30 to 40% of all breakouts fail. That's like a really broad stat and it's not really that helpful of a stat to hang your hat on. It's kind of like saying that the average weather in New York in the winter is like 35 degrees and, and, and it doesn't really help you when on a day like today, it's like 15 outside. It's just nasty. So we're going to have to look deeper into the breakout to understand exactly how to avoid the ones that are prone to failing. If you can identify the ones that are prone to failing, you can sit back and you can change your risk allocation or your expectations for that breakout. And if it does work, you can let it surprise you. And if it doesn't work, you're more on guard. That's the first step to avoiding a false breakout. Understand the times that you need to be more on guard. And it's not every time. There's specific variables that we're getting into that we can talk about what are the things that could occur that lead to you being more on guard. So let's look at those subtle clues that signal a false breakout. We cannot avoid false breakouts, but we can stack the odds in our favor, which is all we really need. So each breakout has a specific metric to look at. So we can talk about extended breaks, rangey breaks, or range into consolidation breaks. And then specifically, we can talk about the, the breaks that have too much pressure. So, so many wicks on one side. And the metric that we're going to use there is we're going to check the number of touches on either side of the range. Too many touches on either side of the range can lead to a break in that range failing. It's sort of like the idea of there's so much pressure and it really should have gone. And there are all these tests of that level and it just didn't do what it needed to do. If it does break out, it's very likely and prone to failing. So we have to be a little more careful about those. For rangey breaks, rangey breaks can be prone to fail specifically when they're not supported by increase in volume. Think about a rangey break, right? We're looking at an example of a rangey break and when that range does break out, what should cause that range to break? It should be something new, new participation coming into the stock. It's very clear on a rangey break, we want to see that distinct and clear increase in volume. 
And then finally on extended breaks, right? So extended breaks are, are prices kind of up and then extends even further. You need to see that reset period. And the really simple concept that we're gonna talk about is the length of the consolidation of that reset period. So that extended break is move up, little bit of a consolidation and then continuation break. As long as that consolidation is long enough, or there's a little bit of a sidestep here, if the volume stays sustained enough, kind of going back to that rangy break, if we get that combination or a, a, a representative of that combination, those are the breakouts that we can really look for. Outside of that, everything else is prone to failure. On extended breaks, if they're not long enough, they're prone to failure. Not long enough with enough volume, prone to failure. Rangy breaks, they're especially prone to failure because it's so much price discovery that's occurring. That's why we need that volume differential. Too much pressure breaks, you really need something distinct. If it's pressing, 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 that is the biggest catch because visually it looks so good. The way to sidestep this, we'll get to it in a second, is really to look for the buildup into the range. So that range that builds into the consolidation, kind of what we talked about earlier, that buildup is really an important factor. And more importantly is where that buildup starts prior to the range break. So we talked about the pressure breaks. What we really wanna see in the best versions of breakouts are when the pressure was actually built on the other side of the breakout. It doesn't have to be a failed breakout on the downside and then a breakout to the upside. It can actually be just pressure built on the other end of that range prior to the breakout. That pressure building and then the buildup into that is exactly what the best breakouts almost always look like. The other check that we wanna have in our favor for these are having multiple timeframes aligned. So we talked about how to avoid the, the kind of really bad situations. Now we're talking all about how to identify the really good situations. And then we're gonna find a middle ground in that. But having multiple timeframes aligned, if it's a consolidation above a key resistance level on, on a one minute chart, but it's also consolidating above a key resistance level on the 15 minute chart. And then you get a press down like that might break to the downside, but it never breaks, you just get pressure. And then you see the build starting with the volume increasing. That is exactly what we wanna see when you have that multiple time frames aligned. A test up into a resistance level that looks like maybe it's gonna break out, maybe it's gonna break out, maybe it's gonna break out, and then it does break out. Is that a trade you're going to take when you have multiple time frames aligned against you, or are you gonna go with the move on the other side? And then most importantly, if you get that failure before the break, this is actually the failed breakdown into the breakout. That's gonna be something that really sets you up for a lot of success. If you had a distinct failure on the other side, distinct failure meaning a quick attempt lower and it failed to get lower and then a quick, very clear build and break on the other side. Those are exactly what we're looking for. Since we've talked about the setups and what specifically we're looking for into the breakouts, and we've covered about six different examples, but since we're talking about the setups, that's only the first part of the equation. That just gets us into the game. We can stack the odds in our favor by understanding the difference between those and, and reducing the, the likelihood that those will fail by the setup involved, but we're still prone to failure. And let's understand why it's so important to take a look at the price action as it's occurring after we've taken the breakout and update the narrative as it's going along. So first we're gonna identify that good breakout, right? We're gonna stack those variables in our favor. We're gonna identify a really good press and then a really good build and then a really good increase in volume. We're gonna take the breakout, but then we're gonna to have to identify what happens in the next five bars. So the next five bars are critical after the break. They're absolutely essential because they tell us the response to the break. Specifically, we're gonna talk about what happens in the next five bars and how the next five bars will dictate, in a lot of cases, the likelihood that we're walking into a failed breakout or a breakout that's going to give us those legs that we're looking for, that multiple opportunity to the upside. Within those five bars, the first check that we're gonna talk about is how are the bars looking? Really what we're doing is reading the tape, but even if you're not gonna read the tape and understand if the tape is aggressive, passive, indecisive, or, or lethargic, even if you're not looking at the tape, you can look at the bars, even just the one minute bars, and you can start to think, is this aggressive participation? Is this passive participation? Those are the two that are acceptable. When a breakout occurs, you want either aggressive participation or you want passive participation. You do not want indecisive participation or lethargic participation. It seems pretty clear, but we'll look at some, some examples here. And as we're looking at the examples, you can see the difference between aggressive participation, where just people are tripping over themselves to be involved in that breakout, passive participation, where there's a big player that's underlying everything and they're likely to just be there for a period of time. Or that indecisive, almost that like quick, like, I don't know, like, is this going to work or is it not going to work? Even worse is that lethargic. It like goes up, but then it just has nothing there behind it. Those four characteristics are the first starting point that we look for in the next five bars. Five bars after the break tells us everything we need to know about the probability of that break working or failing. If we don't get that acceptable category of bars, that aggressive or that passive buying on the upside breaks or selling on the, on the downside breaks, and instead we get indecisive price action, even worse, we get lethargic response to that break. We have a really clear picture of what we're trying to do and what likely is going to happen with this breakout, if it's gonna work or it's gonna fail. Now that we've identified a good break, what a good breakout looks like, how we've been able to sidestep the potentials of a failed breakout, and we've identified what should be happening in the next five bars, we have put ourselves in a position to make a trading decision. We can do one of three things. We can stand, we can add, 
or we can fold. We'll talk about three different trades here and three different actions that you should take. So we get that passive buying on the break and that passive buying is there. That is the situation to stand. There's really nothing to do. We're expecting that big player to be there. We don't have to add risk because that big player is supporting it. And it's likely that this trade is going to continue for a nice sustained period of time. Our risk reward is going to take care of itself. The probability is showing us it's there. We just stand. If we take action, if we add or if we fold, we're probably taking away the EV of the trade. So that passive sustained buying to the upside or selling to the downside, that's just a reason to stand. We don't look for another trade quite yet. We don't do anything with it. We just hold our position. We don't exit it. We don't add to it. We just sit there. We can add when there is aggressive buying. So that build looks right. The break is appropriate. We get that quick move up and then that sustained buying pressure where we're holding the top part of the range for that five bar period. The reason we can add is because that's an entirely different trade on its own. Our add isn't adding to our core position. Our stop isn't below the low of the range or below the breakout price. Our stop's actually below that recent consolidation. We've seen the aggressive buy. So we're allowing that consolidation, that price action to give us an opportunity to add to our trade. We can add and then look for that second leg and we can exit our add into that second leg and still maintain our core. Finally, and this is the one that is most important to know, you need to be able to identify when to fold. And we talked about the unacceptable price action. That is immediately a fold. If you look at your trading PL over the course of a year, over the course of your career even, the best opportunities will take care of themselves. And you wanna make the most in the best opportunities. Even more importantly for preserving your upward sloping p &L curve is you want to fold when things are not at their best because those play more psychologically on you. Whether it works or it doesn't work, it wasn't working the right way. So it's really tough to sit there and say, if it works, wow, I made a good trading decision. If it didn't work, oh, I made a bad trading decision. The reality is it should do exactly what you want it to do. And we've identified what we want it to do. We want breakouts that are going to be met with aggressive buying or passive buying, passive sustained buying. Finally, we talked about one of my favorite trading patterns, and really it's kind of a weird evolution that occurred, but wanted to bring it back to that. So let's say you take the trade and we get that breakout and the buying is just really lethargic, right? What do you do? Well, you fold, you, you cut your position and then it fails and it comes back down. It turned into a failed breakout. So this is exactly why you fold your position because now you can look at that failed breakout more objectively. Now, if that trade didn't work for me, does that mean it, it, it didn't work for everybody? Well, yes, exactly. All the participation to the upside there Everybody's wrong there. If you're disciplined enough to say, this is not trading the right way and you fold, you exit your position, you're putting yourself in the position to take the other side of that trade, to take the failed breakout trade. So here's a very straightforward way to trade the failed breakout. You do not jump in as soon as it fails. That is like the biggest mistake because what's happening, it failed on one side of the range, but it's really just in range. So it's into that cluster of activity. You wanna watch the price action and distinctly, if the sellers take control, once it breaks the low end of the range on the other side, you can enter the position. And ideally it's gonna break the range and then give you even a retest. Those are the best ones. And then continuation. But the distinctness of the participation following the breakout can give you that failed breakout setup. You don't wanna take everything as a failed breakout. Everything that breaks and then fails is not a failed breakout. It's not a trade. It's just an idea that what is coming later can turn into that failed breakout. So if you get that breakout that looks okay when you take it, and then you get that lethargic price action, and then you see it start to curl back down and you have to take it off because you don't have the criteria. You can exit your position. You can take a step back, get some objectivity, watch the price action and how the sellers are taking control. And if they do take control, they're likely to take it below the low of the range and then give you a failed breakout trade where you can enter against the high of the range or if you have the right price action, especially if you get that break and retest scalp, that second chance scalp, you can stop right above that high and you can walk into a trade that not only did you preserve your risk on the upside, but you could have made your trade on the day by being involved in the downside after the sellers really showed their hands. To sum it all up really quickly, we're gonna avoid extended breaks unless enough time has gone by. And time usually means about one half of the time that that initial move occurred. So if the initial move was 15 bars higher, we want at least a seven minute consolidation. That way we avoid that extended break of 15 bars, two bars, then we're looking for continuation. We're gonna avoid ranging breaks without volume. We're gonna avoid the pressure breaks where there's pressure, pressure, pressure to the upside, pressure, pressure, pressure to the upside, and then it breaks. Just too many touches is not appropriate. We're gonna take the breaks with the appropriate buildups, that higher high, higher low, that distinct pressure on one side, and then it leading to the appropriate buildup on the other side. We're gonna adjust our bet sizing, our position sizing, by thinking about what do we hold, where do we add, and when do we fold? What we didn't have time to cover here is our reasons to sell. And the reason why we didn't is we've already done a video on reasons to sell. 